Let's all stand this morning. We'll sing, I know whom I have believed.
Some of them were singing praise the Lord yeah. with pouty faces. You're kidding. I'm not. I was looking and not everybody was smoking. Praise the Lord ought to be a happy thing. Well, it should be. Yeah, it's not a pouty thing. So let's do the chorus one more time. Smiley okay. faces. Now smile this time, okay? <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory for the things He hath done. Now, that's much better. Amen. 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 You may be, you seated. May be seated. This is Billy Sutherland, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Brenham, Texas. For those of you who are here, you probably knew that. Those of you who are watching from the internet, either now or in the future. That's what that is all about. Uh, we have a, by the way, when they were smiling, they were singing louder. So they maybe have to remind them of that from time to time. Y'all did great. Good, good, good. A uh, number of uh, prayer concerns. Bob and Polly, who are fairly new to us. Uh, uh, Bob, of course, has uh, cancer and um, has had lots of challenges of late, and he is going to be in hospice. So pray for Polly as she ministers to him, and several of you who have been through similar situations are reaching out and offering help, and we greatly appreciate that. So pray for Bob and Polly. And then Sue Juracek had uh, surgery again, and she's recovering. Uh, as soon as we get a room number, you don't have that, do you, yet? We're waiting to get a room assigned for her and a room number, so then we'll be able to call and check on her personally. Right now, we're operating through her daughter. So, and then uh, Raquel, wave your hand back there, Raquel, had a scare and was in the ER and has not been through some fun, but uh, pray for Raquel. We love you and uh, wish for you good health and pray for you good health. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, if you would just help us to shut out the things of the world, to focus on you, your word, what is shared today in scripture and song and testimony. Father, help us to remember to be in prayer for Bob and Polly, for Sue, for Raquel, for others who have prayer concerns. Lord, we lift them up to you and don't pretend to be so smart as to advise you what to do, but just say, God, you are such a great God, such an awesome God, and we commend these to you for your care as you see fit. Be with us now through the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Announcements are coming. Denise will help us with that. And I slid some in there, Denise, so be prepared. You're not surprised, are you? <laughs> Please let your friends know if you are that we are live on Facebook if you're watching this morning. And also share our live stream. If you are watching not on Facebook, you can email us at comments at calvarybrenham.org to comment. And we are working on the alternative. I thought I had it this week, but we had some upload issues sending two streams at a time. So I'm working with Sudden Link to figure out how we can get past that or do we need a different internet service provider. But you can actually go to live.calvarybrenham.org and see a TV with Calvary Brenham on it. Not operating yet, but if you want to look at those words, you certainly can. <laughs> and in the future, not only is that where you can watch from home, you can watch Calvary Brenham's Sunday morning service, but there's also a chat log on the side. Uh, we can take prayer requests. We can. It's just kind of a neat thing. Not ready for prime time yet, but we're working on it. And then just a reminder, the pastor and men do meet Tuesdays at 10. Wednesday night, light meal at 545, live stream 615 to 645, and in-house wrap-up 645 to 7. Now, this week is a little bit different because we have business meeting. We have business meeting and maybe a change-up, possible change in format. Possible change. And the change in format will still serve the meal at 545, 
But what we're thinking about doing is maybe I'll do the live stream part earlier in the day and then have it recorded so that it can play during the Wednesday night thing. But we're getting more and more people coming back to Wednesday night and they're not as interactive when we're live on the internet. Um, maybe that's a good thing now that I think about it. <laughs> as I look around and some of them are smiling, yeah, you just wait. <laughs> So we're looking at options. So even if we don't live stream the actual Wednesday night, there will be something triggered to come on at that time. So people at home, we only have a few people now who are not coming on Wednesday night that watch it from home, but we don't want to cheat them out of the, uh, and then everything else will be in house, including a business meeting this week yes. that you mentioned. Yes, at 645 this Wednesday night, we need to establish a nominating committee and then we will from there work on our committees for this year that's right and some budget is not issues but items we haven't approved budgets in a we while, haven't so. had a business meeting in a long time and somehow we've managed we've done and that well. and god yeah. is blessing god's blessing even without business meetings can you imagine that maybe we got to not have them more often all right well and the last one was young at heart we skipped right oh past yeah that. oh hold on a minute i can actually push that and come back to yes, it yes they are now meeting the second and fourth tuesdays of the month uh, Tuesday, May 25th at 6 o'clock will be the next one, and then again in June. All righty. And then thank you to everyone who helped with the car clinic. We had a good turnout. We had a good time. We did 21 cars, and then after it was all over, one more showed up. So I did that. So 22 cars we did for our car clinic yesterday, and uh, thank you for everybody who helped. Single mom, don't have a mechanic. Family, bring your car to our free car clinic at Calvary Baptist Church. Have some refreshments while we check your battery, belts, and hoses, and check and adjust your tire pressures and fluids. Then we'll give you a coupon for a free oil change. This is Riley Guinness, granddaughter of Pastor Billy Sutherland of Calvary Baptist Church of Brenham, inviting you to our free car clinic on Saturday, May 15th from 8 to 11 a.m. We're on Neva Street across from the tax office. For more information, visit calvarybrenham.org. Wasn't that classy? <laughs> that was because I had had my, you know, surgery and stitches and everything, and I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to speak clearly enough to do the radio ad. And Riley Guinness stepped up and said, I'll do it. <laughs> so we went down and recorded that. Now, those of you who are watching, this is already over. This was last Saturday. We were just playing in case anybody didn't hear uh, the radio ad, but it was played on the local radio stations all week. And uh, I actually heard it a couple times. And then uh, Master Chef Joel Romo. Raise your hand there, Joel. <laughs> you, <laughs> you didn't see him at Car Clinic unless you went upstairs because he was in the kitchen slaving away, making that wonderful breakfast that we had downstairs. And once again, we had, in particular, two ladies who came and had their car serviced. And even long after it was serviced and ready to go, they just sat and talked in fellowship and that's kind of what it's all about. Yes. So we provide not just the car service, but also the people service. And it was a good time. And then this young lady, uh, anybody know? really bad picture. <laughs> she was trying to hide behind the certificate. Yes, I was, and you weren't letting me. <laughs> That's the certificate that we give for a car clinic. They get a free oil change at Apple Ford. And uh, Denise does a whole bunch of stuff leading up to and during. And you don't see her downstairs necessarily either, but she's behind the scenes doing all kinds of good stuff. So... Let's give her and Joel a round of applause, too. <laughs> and uh, Make sure you check our website, calvaryburnham.org, for the latest news and updates. And children, come on ahead. And as they're coming, Jesus loves me, this I know. Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, sing happy birthday to May. Steve, back there, um, go ahead and stand up a minute. You might not recognize him because he shaved his, we told him if we give him a candy bar, would he shave his beard? And he said yes. So 
There's Steve. Happy birthday yesterday, car clinic. Anybody else have birthdays in May? Anybody? There's Miss Shirley. Anybody else? Oh, right up here. All right. Anybody else? Shirley? <laughs> birthdays in May? David? Anybody else? All right, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And then we have, if you notice, this is not James Wilkinson up here. This is Jacob Baker. This is Dr. Bruce Baker's son, Jacob, who's between churches right now, so we decided we'd steal him and let him preach this morning. Y'all slide over this way a little bit, Morgan, because he's going to come down there and sit in where you are. Brother Jacob, and your microphone is on. So... Um, Oh, come on. You're not old enough to do that. So you do missions to Africa. Yes. And how long does it take to get to Africa? Oh, goodness. Forever and ever. <laughs> and it feels even longer when you're in economy and you're crammed together like cattle on the back of a truck. Okay. I want to say the first flight is eight hours and the second flight is another eight hours. And then once you land in Africa, how far to get to where you're serving? Uh, it's not too far. We're actually really close to the, the main church is very close to the airport. But the churches that we serve are across five different countries. And the conference that I teach at will be in one of these five countries. So depending on how far I have to go, it's sometimes not very far and it takes a long time to get there. Because they have potholes bigger than cars that you have to drive through. So you could lose your car in a pothole. Yeah, we might have to change microphones out of him or is his battery dying or what. Anyway, um, we'll figure that out while we're talking here. Um, years ago, in Baptist missions work or in missions work in, in general, we stopped talking so much about countries and started talking about more about people groups. Mm -hmm. Because some people groups, they live in the east side of this country and the west side of that country, and that's a group, and there's boundaries aren't the same as they are here are they no say something about that bit. well in africa there's three main people groups the hutus the tutsis and the twa and depending on the country you go to will kind of uh, tell you the, the blend of what they are me not being from africa they all look like africans to me i i can't really tell the difference but i asked my translator and he says oh yeah that one's this that one's this that one's this and you can just he could just tell and in the office, you were talking to me about they shave their heads. Why is that? Not all of them, just the children. All of the children shave all their beautiful hair off. And it is, all of your heads would be a lot shorter. It would look m closer to me than it would be to any of you. That's true. You can tell if somebody is in school or not if their head is shaved. And why do they do that? Lice is a big problem down there. And yeah. so if you go to school, you know, like here you have to get certain shots or you have to be of a certain age. Over there you have to shave your head before you can come to school. And, and I passed at a church way back when where we had several families. Hi, everybody. We had several families that had young children that were susceptible to lice. And twice a year I'd have to give the speech about because our church provided for free the medicines and the shampoos and, and everything to care for that. And, and after that talk, for the next couple of days, I'd be scratching my head. Because <laughs> it's a terrible problem. I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't yeah. <laughs> have much of a problem with that. And, and you're not shaving your head just to keep it from having lice, right? You're it's, it's a style choice. Yeah, I'm not style balding, choice. and you'll All never right. know. So your translators, where, how do you find your translators when you go to Africa? Well, the head of the church that um, kind of runs the organization, his name is Flora Bear Ka uh, Kazingufu. And he's my main translator. Um, if you've ever been translated before, you say one sentence and you wait for somebody else to say that sentence in a different language. I was at a church and I was preaching one time and I was translated three times. So first I said it in English, then it was repeated in French, then repeated in Swahili, and then repeated in Kirundi, which is their local language. And it took a while just to tell a small story. So a 20 minute sermon could be an hour and a half. Well, that's like most preachers, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Anybody have a good question for him? Yes. Do they have beards? Do they have beards? 
Not many people do. Almost nobody does, and I don't know why. Huh. Uh, the the uh, uh, there's not a lot of families over there that have been Christians and their grandparents are Christians and their great grandparents were Christians, so they're still learning the stories for the most part by themselves. So one of the things that I thought was really good about having Brother Baker here this morning was we give money to missions and it gets sent out and a lot of times we don't know what what's really going on out there, so it's really neat to be able to have somebody who's been there who can tell us. Mm -hmm what's happening on the ground, so we're so glad to have you. Any final thoughts before we pray and let these kids go to Children's Church? If you kids wanted to help, there's one thing that you guys could do that would be probably the biggest help possible, and that's if you could pray for us, because there is a lot of work, and a lot of people over there don't like Christians, so if you can pray for us, that would be the best thing that anybody, grown or little, could ever do. All right, they're in. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for these children. Thank you, Father, for the mission work that is in Africa and all over the world. But I just pray that you help us to be more attentive to the fact that there are people who need the gospel in their own language everywhere. Let's particularly pray for these, our friends in Africa, and be with Riley as she tells these boys and girls more about Jesus. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Oh, we didn't open the treasure chest, so let's do that. Okay, it's open. Thank you. <laughs> we, I couldn't fit him in the treasure chest, so. And then we have some more about the mission work, but some of this is not really good for little ears because it's not such fun stuff to hear, so. Would you go ahead with that? Good morning. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the privilege to come and join you in worship this morning and to share something that, uh, that both I and my family are very passionate about. Uh, most Americans have no idea what's happening in Africa. Have any of you heard of the movie Hotel Rwanda? came out, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. Okay, so you then, that movie's real. I mean, obviously it's been a... Uh, turned into a movie, but the things that happened in there are very real. Uh, back in the 90s, um, the president of Rwanda was flying on an airplane, and the plane was shot down. Um, the president of Rwanda is a Hutu, and Rwanda is largely comprised of Hutus. They blame the Tutsis for it, and that's what began the, um, the Rwandan genocide, if you've heard of that. Um, the Hutus started um, killing uh, the Tutsis anywhere they found them. There were stories of husbands killing wives, neighbors killing neighbors, friends killing friends, because the Hutus are ev or the uh, Tutsis are evil and the Hutus need to protect themselves. So the, the Tutsis go across the border into the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they start building militias who then go and attack the Hutus in Rwanda who then respond against the Tutsis. And this escalation grew and grew and grew until the uh, mid-2000s with the Second Congo War, also known as the African World War. So think of it this way. Nine countries are at war, 25 different army groups, killing more people than anything on Earth since World War II. What does that have to do with the work that we do? During this time, American missionaries fled the scene. Nobody was safe. Everywhere was open warfare, and so the missionaries left and went back to, the, back to the states. So they plant all these churches, and now the locals have to run these churches, but their biblical education is about as good as second and third grade Sunday school. And so they're doing the best that they can, given the tools that were left behind for them. When the violence died down, sort of, um, missionaries started coming back. But the missionaries that came back were, by and large, the health and wealth prosperity gospel, where God wants you to be rich, God wants you to be healthy, and all you need to do is claim that, tell God you're going to be, and he will make it so. That's not the gospel. So, about 10 years ago, Dr. Bruce um, went down to Africa and started leading a conference to teach pastors. 
those that are leading these churches need to have better education so that they can uh, lead their flocks. Uh, five years ago, as his health was declining due to the ALS, um, I remember walking into his study one time and he was upset. What are you upset about? Well, this guy who was going to go and take over for me no longer can because his mission agency said it's too dangerous over there. And so I left there and I just I prayed about it and the Lord gave me just this, can you do it? And I didn't have a good reason to say no. So I went, which was terrifying. My uh, contact, which is a great and godly man, was an hour late picking me up from the airport. So I don't have any phones any cell service, any internets, any, I don't know his phone number. I don't know what the man looks like. So here I am, three times wider than the locals, the only white person for a 250-mile area standing there looking like a child left at the grocery store for an hour. But when when I met up with him, we went, we preached, and I fell in love with the work that they're doing over there. And so for the past decade, Becoming Mature, which is the organization that sends us, um, is uh, been going to teach the pastors and help equip them to do the ministry there. Now, Becoming Mature is a little bit different than most missions organizations because uh, most missions organizations will send a missionary to go do work. We don't have any missionaries. Um, I am the missionary, and I go on a trip once a year for about 10, 11 days. Uh, and most missions organizations will go to plant a church, to found an orphanage, or to do evangelistic outreach. But we do what I call in-reach. We work within the body to train them up, to equip them, to give them whatever support they need so that they can do the ministry to the local populace. So what have we done outside of teaching? Uh, three years ago, I was told that we need to buy Bibles. That's a good thing, right? Buying Bibles is great. So we scrounged up every single Bible we could find in the capital city of Bujumbura, and we found about 15 of them. We brought them to the conference and started handing them to pastors whose Bibles were just completely falling apart. And to me, I'm not thinking this is such a big deal until I realized this wasn't the pastor's Bible. This was the church's Bible. How many of you have your Bibles here today? If you could hold your Bible up. Okay, now put it down next to you. It's vanished. It's gone. Through the power of television magic... That Bible is no longer here. Now, if you don't have it, what would you do? You would grab your phone, right? How many of you have used a Bible app on your phone? Bad news, your phone's dead, and electricity gets shut off all the time. Now what do you do? Well, I I know Pastor Billy has a Bible. We could borrow it from him for a couple days and then bring it back, and this is how they live. So they have, so bringing in 15 new Bibles was a huge benefit to the churches we were able to support. Two years ago, an optometrist donated a box of reading glasses. I thought the Africans just had fantastic eyesight, which is why none of them had glasses. So we gave one to, past, or to Elder Timothy's wife, Jean, sweet woman. And, you know, I felt like the optometrist. Let's try glasses one or glasses two. Oh, right, I have... So here's the, uh, um, let me go back. I promised I'd be five minutes, but I'm I'm here as a missionary, so I'm obligated to be long-winded. This is a picture of the uh, um, teaching that occurs with the pastors, right? These are all the men here engaging in the the learning. Pastor Flory is the gentleman in white in the very front who is translating for me. And then we would hold the evangelistic outreaches where we would have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 just locals with no entertainment, no electricity, no TVs, no phones, no games, nothing. This is fun for them, so they come and they get to hear the gospel. So we would give out um, Bibles and uh, to the different pastors here. Now, as, as we were handing out these eyeglasses, you know, all right, Jean, glass one, glass two, one, I got to play that game for a while. It was hilarious. They didn't understand the joke, but that's just me. Um, so Joan finally gets a pair of glasses, and he says, start reading your Bible. So he s- she starts reading it. And Pastor Floyd says, no, 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 and gives her another pair of glasses. She puts it on, and her face lights up. She's smiling ear to ear. This was the first time in years she could read her own Bible. She carried it with her everywhere. She couldn't read it because she didn't have glasses that she could read with. The simple things that we take for granted here in the church is really scarce over there, and you don't realize it until you don't have it anymore. 
So this year we are looking for glasses that are prescription of 2.5 or greater that we can send down to Africa to give out to those with the reading glasses that just aren't strong enough for them. And lastly, we found out that the government of Burundi has declared that if a religion doesn't have an adequate building, if the building's not good enough, then obviously you're a cult. This is one of the churches that I went to preach at, and the, the floor is made up of tarp from UN aid packages that were parachuted down. The walls are corrugated tin, as is the, uh, the roof, and where the roof and the walls meet in the front at that peak, that's just open air right there. This is a good enough building. A lot of buildings are not this good. And so the churches wants to bulldoze the church, the government wants to bulldoze the churches down in order to put something else up because this is not a real religion, it's a cult because you can tell by their building. So we have been working uh, with Pastor Flory to raise funds to, in to upgrade these buildings to meet muster for the government. And as Pastor Flory is aggressively planting more and more churches, right now there's somewhere between 42 and 45 churches um, that are within the REMAC denomination under Pastor Flory, um, he's spreading the gospel like it's, like it's wildfire in the open savanna. And people are getting saved left and right, but they need buildings, they need land. And it would surprise you to know that you can buy land in Africa and construct a nice-looking church for the low, low cost of $10,000. Most churches I've been to are at minimum a quarter million, and the ones we've been attending lately is upwards of three to five million. That would plant 50 churches. And so the work that we're doing over there doesn't take a lot, but it does take some. And so we are, so this has put a lot of this into perspective for me, just the need to find Bibles, to find glasses, just to have a good enough roof over your head to have the privilege of being inside of a building. And this is why I'm excited to partner with uh, Becoming Mature and with the REMAC denomination because we are able to meet the needs of the local African pastors to strengthen them as they are just booming at the seams in revival over in Africa. And we would absolutely love for Calvary Baptist and for you individually to join us and support us in the work that we're doing. On the back table by the flowers, um, I don't know what kind of flowers they are, so just those flowers, uh, we have our latest newsletter. If you'd like to read about the work that we've been doing within the last three to six months, the work that we are going to be doing um, shortly, they're back there. If you would like to partner up with us, well, unfortunately, uh, we have these brilliant beautiful pamphlets. And if you'd like to collect those, I left those on the table back at my house in Iowa. You can just go to the back after the service and pick those up. Um, we do have a few pamphlets here um, that will give you more information about how you can partner with us. But more than anything, what the, what the brothers and sisters in Africa need is just your prayer, your love and your prayer. And so if you would remember them when you do your prayer time, they would be greatly appreciative. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> if you would stand with me and we'll sing all hail the power of Jesus name
anybody who's visiting for the first time. Anybody visiting for the first time? Raise your hand. Anybody? First time visitors? Re over here, so we'll recognize him in a little bit. In fact, we already have. Anybody else? We're glad that you are here and glad that those are watching from home or from wherever, either now or in the future. Uh, time for our tithes and offerings. The collection boxes are in the back. There's all kinds of ways to give. You can give online, calvarybrenham.org slash giving. There's the contact information for us and then the boxes that we have newly installed at the entrances, if you'd like to do that. Uh, we're going to be singing in just a moment. My chains are gone. But before we do, I want you to look in your bulletin. And I don't have mine, but I know what it says. There's a story there about the background of My Chains Are Gone. Um, Chris Tomlin wrote the part that is added on to the part that we know as Amazing Grace. There was a film to be made, and uh, the producers of the film had gotten word to Chris Tomlin, we'd like you to do something with the song Amazing Grace. And he began running it through his mind, and eventually these other words just began to come to him, and he tacked it on at the end, and it is what we have today as Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Jenny's going to lead that for us.
Brother Jacob. There's your clicker. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you would all grab your Bibles and place them on the seat next to you and leave them shut, I think it would be great for us to do something new for once. Let's pretend we're Africans. If you have your Bible on your phone, go ahead and just turn it completely off, which I know is going to terrify most of the teenagers in this room. It will turn on again, I promise. Today we're going to rely solely on what is presented by the pastor to help you gather a little bit of what it's like to be an African in church for the only thing really that we're missing is that Africans have no ability to stand still when they sing it's it's impossible which makes me stick out even more because this is about as much as I dance right here let's go ahead and open in prayer merciful father we praise your name that you have brought us together today, that we are able to be in your word. Lord, I pray that as we look at what you have for us, that you would move in us, change our hearts, help us to be what it is you want us to be, so that we can grow closer to you. Lord, help us to think your thoughts, but Lord, today help us to feel your heart, so that we can love the way that you do. Amen. Now, I'm sure that many of you know Psalm 139 fairly well or at least you recognize a lot of it. It has some of the more famous scripture in it. It says in verses 13 to 14, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Now, typically when we see this passage, the first thing our minds go to is the right to life movement that every life is precious, and that every life belongs to God. That's true, right? Amen? Now, I have a hobby of watching YouTube, okay? And I will watch 15-minute videos that teach me something that I won't, I will never use this information unless I get onto Jeopardy, okay? But I'm smarter because of it, which is fantastic. And, uh, well, let's just start here. How many of you have seen this dress before? Right? How many of you know 100% with complete uncertainty the color of this dress? This dress was famous a couple years ago for dividing friendships, splitting homes apart, and ending friendships. This dress, what color is it? Blue? How How many think it's blue and black? How many of you here are completely incorrect and think it's white and gold? Shame on you. Is this the time when we pray for the congregation? Okay, it's not. This dress is definitively blue and black, and if you disagree, well, you are wrong. By the way, as I was researching for this service, um, this dress actually is blue and black. The retailer who sells this dress, who has it on the rack, says that's a blue and black dress. Why do you guys see white and gold? That's just nonsense. Well, researchers have found that the reason we see white and gold is because your brain doesn't think you're smart enough. Your brain says your eyes are tricking you. This dress is in the shade. And so your eyes are readjusting what they see in order to help filter and correct the color of this dress. Our bodies are just magnificent machines, aren't they? What about this? We all know what these are, right? Strawberries. Strawberries, as I've heard it said in the South. Now, what color are the strawberries on that screen? I know, I know it's a little grainy, but how many of you see red strawberries? There is not one red pixel on that screen. Not one red pixel anywhere on there. That entire image is completely green. And if you don't trust me, we can get out of, we can go on the computer, zoom in 400 times and look at every single picture. There's not one shred of red in there. Why do you see red? It's because your brain is trying to fix what's going on. We know that that's not a green image. Those are strawberries. So clearly we need to adjust and your brain will change what it sees. Now, if you're colorblind like me, those are gray strawberries, obviously. What's even more fun is that if you are here today speaking, 
you are hearing my voice at the exact same time that you are seeing my lips move, which is different because you've got the speed of sound and you've got the speed of light. Do you guys know which one is faster? Speed of light, right? Do you know about how much faster it is? 870,000 times faster than the speed of sound. And yet, as I have learned through YouTube, which, yes, I will use somewhere in life, your brain takes snapshots of about one-tenth of a second at a time, reorganizes it, and then gives it to you. Which is why, even though the sound of my voice is way behind the image of my lips moving, your brain sees them going identically. It isn't until you're well over 100 feet away that your brain starts to notice there's a lag. So when I say that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, isn't that kind of miraculous the way that God created our brains to help us interpret this world in ways we don't even fully understand? You see, it's with this sense of wonder and amazement that we should hold when we look at the human body, right? And so when God speaks of the church in 1 Corinthians 12 and he calls it the body, we should have that same sense of wonder and awe because this, even though we are fearfully and wonderfully made, so is the body of Christ. And so just like YouTube videos give me a better appreciation of the, of the human body today, as we look at God's word, I hope I can give you a better appreciation of the body of Christ. It's, let's go ahead and read through the passage, starting in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would, be, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that it may be no division in the body, and that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. As we look at this passage, I want to share key, four key main thoughts that we want to take out of this. And the first one is, you only have one body. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, I know this is going to blow a lot of people's minds, so please remain seated in case you faint. You only have one body. Obvious statement, right? We, all, we already know that. Don't you wish, though, that we had multiple bodies we could put on and take off? This is the body I take to the buffet, right? This is the body I take to the gym. And, this, and, and I wear the gym body on my way out, I quickly change in the car to my buffet body, go out to eat, right? And then come back. Lately, I've been uh, starting to work out. Thank you, I know you can tell. And it's painful, because my wife, a beautiful young woman, loves to cook. And my children who are learning how to cook love to make treats. Daddy, can I go make some brownies? Sure, sweetie, if that's what you want to do. And there's always brownies in the house. Do you know how many sit-ups it takes to get rid of a brownie? Too many is the answer. 
But we only have just the one body. And so it is in the body of Christ. There's not 17 bodies of Christ. There's only one. Again, obvious statement, right? But see, that's the thing. We know that's obvious, and yet we don't really live like that all the time. Because, as I've been told many times, that Sunday morning is the most racially segregated time in America. You have the white church, you have the black church. If you go to big cities, you've got the Korean church, the Chinese church. The town that I'm from, they have an island church where South Pacific Islanders have, are living, and they have their own services. You have the Mexican church, and when I talk about the ministry, it's always the ministry to the African church. And when we make these divisions in our mind, we start to think that there are more than one body of Christ. There's us and them. We are the body of Christ, and they are separate from us. And let me remind you, there is only one body of Christ. So when I present to you the things that we are doing in Africa, what I am not telling you is what that body is doing. I'm telling you what your body is doing. My elbow has no idea what my liver is doing. To be completely frank with you, I barely know what my liver is doing. And yet, it's still working. And without my liver, I would be in some serious trouble. Do we have any medical professionals? Anyone that knows what a liver is for? No? I thought it was just something gross that my grandparents fed me. I, I don't know what it does. I know you need it. What about the pancreas? My grandfather died of pancreatic cancer. Why don't you just get rid of it then? Do you really need it? I have no idea what that thing's for. And yet, even though I don't know what it's for, that's a part of my body. I need it. In the same way, we should stop dividing the church of God, dividing the people of God by ours, by us and them, the white church, the black church, the African church, the Korean church. We are the body. Now, hang on. Let's put a little asterisk in here, okay? I'm not talking about this one unity movement, how we all worship the same God. No, no, no. I'm talking about believers in Christ. There are believing churches Believers who don't attend this church, I'm not talking about heresy and it's all good, we should just big group hug. We're not going there, okay? But when we talk about those who are saved, those who worship the Father correctly, those who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of our risen Lord, we are one body with them. So that when I talk about the work we're doing with the brothers in Tanzania, in Uganda, in Rwanda, Congo, and Burundi, we are one with them. They aren't them and we are us. We are one body. Let's look at number two. You belong to the body. Which I'm sure many here are thinking, well, I hope so. I come here enough, right? Haven't you ever had, it's called imposter syndrome. You look around, you see how great everybody else is doing, you're like, what am I doing here? I had that the first time I went to Africa. I was teaching these pastors. I'm not a pastor. I'm a youth pastor. That's not the real thing, right? That's like a fake pastor. That's like Cub Scouts versus the Army, okay? We're just playing around with it. And by profession, I'm a youth pastor. And so as I'm training up pastors, leading organizations, as I'm teaching heads of denominations, I'm sitting here thinking, what am I doing here? I even remember I was uh, messaging my father while I was in Africa. I don't know what I'm doing. We need to find somebody else. And he says, you know what? You are perfectly qualified. Do you know why? Because you're the one there. Nobody else went. I belong to the body. You belong to the body. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how smart you are. You belong to the body. Let's see what it says, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, But of many, if the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, that's you, each one of them as he chose if all were just th- were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. 
Now, like I said, I'm a youth pastor. And when I teach this passage to the youth, I have an illustration I use. This lady right here, the, the one in the shining suit, her name is Brianna. She is a student at Moody looking to go into uh, full-time ministry. The gentleman with his back to us is her little brother, Remington. And he is doing what every little brother wants to do, wrapping his sister in saran wrap. Now, if you've ever covered a potluck dish in saran wrap, it's not that big of a deal. And yet, when you take an entire roll and you wrap somebody up in that, they cannot move. Not one joint, not one muscle, not one anything they can't move. And so I asked, what would happen if we took away just a few parts of your body? Most of the body is still doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Really, the only thing we took away are the joints. So then we gently lay them down on the ground, right? Because seriously, you can't keep your balance, so if you just give them a gentle push, they fall like a cut tree, okay, straight down. So we gently lay them down, and I put an Oreo at their feet. Everybody likes Oreos, right? I can tell everyone here is sound asleep because it is a proven fact that everybody likes Oreos. Thank you. Hallelujah. All right. So I put an Oreo at their feet, and I say, okay, first one to eat the Oreo wins. So there's like three of them. And they're all just kind of doing this type of a thing, trying to wiggle around to get to the Oreo. Now, how many of you have ever eaten an Oreo before? Okay, if you have not, shame on you. See me after service. We'll get that fixed quickly, okay? Oreos are not hard to eat, are they? My two-year-old eats an Oreo. He's a professional at it. He's two, okay? This is a simple task, but when you take away a few parts of the body, the entire body becomes very ineffective, now, the thing about Brianna is she is a very impressive young woman. You ask her a question, she's smart as a whip. She'll answer it. If you're having a rough time, she is a great comfort, very empathetic. She's a great friend. She's very smart, so she can think critically, and she's very creative. She plays a mean piano. She can enjoy music. She can enjoy food. She can still smell, still hear. She has all five of her senses still, right? I mean, we didn't take that much away from her, did we? And yet she can't do something as simple as eat an Oreo. Something that I have figured out to a science on how to do. Now think about what it would take for her to take that. Hips, knees, elbows, thumbs, eyes working together, being coordinated by a brain, the entire body working together for even the simplest of tasks. Now let's examine the most worthless part of the body. The little toe. Right? It's that one toe that's like the ugliest part of your body, and it's really only, you know, that big. It's the, it's the piggy that went wee, wee, wee all the way home. That is not unimportant. Now, I hate that body part because it seems like God gave me that part only to stub it into corners and chairs of, of or legs of chairs, right? And when that happens, there is a shock that makes you feel like you're starting a seizure because you hurt your tiny little toe. And yet, you need that toe more than you realize. People who have lost their little toe find that they no longer have a sense of balance. They have to learn how to just stand upright again because that little toe, just tiny little messages to the brain, helps it stay upright. And you have to retrain your body when you lose something as little as the little toe. What does this mean for us? You belong to the body of Christ. You are valuable. The body of Christ would be less good, less effective. We would be worse off if you were not here because we need you, specifically you, not just in general you, specifically you. Why? Because God arranged the members exactly how he chose it to be, and he chose you. And every time we see the body as an example, it's always tied in with using our gifts to serve the body. My, my knees don't serve other people. They serve my body. Your gifts were given to you. What you are good at, what you love, what you're passionate about has been given to you by God so that you can serve the body. Are you serving the body? I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too busy, 
I'm not going to be the best choice for this. All things I have said to myself on many occasions, and yet God chose me for the task that he has given me, just like he's chosen you. Number three, they belong in the body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the part of the body that seems to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the parts that lack it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. Just like nobody can tell you that you don't belong in the body, you can't tell anyone else they don't belong here. How many of you have ever said, I need you to leave the church, you don't belong here? (laughs) Right? Nobody has. Right? So let's just move on to point four. Except that we do this without even realizing it. I remember when I was a teenager, right? I was off at college, and it was time to find a new church to go to. And frankly, I think I'd rather visit the dentist than look for a new church. It's just not a fun experience, and it's always uncomfortable and awkward, and I'm by myself, and this is one of those growing moments where I have to become an adult, which who wants to do that? And all right, fine, we'll go and try this church. So I go into church. I'm there about 10 minutes early, walk down the center aisle, take a seat right on the edge. I look just like that, like a lost puppy who doesn't know where home is. And I sit down, and I'm nervous, and I'm feeling awkward. And here comes a woman. I'm like, finally, someone will say hi to me. Um, excuse me, sir. I need you to move. This row belongs to the, and I don't remember the last names. What? New person. New visitor, right? This, you can see, they laid their Bibles there, which is the Christian version of calling dibs or shotgun in a car. I, um, okay. So I got up and I went and sat somewhere else. You know what that said to me? You don't belong here. You don't belong here. I'll tell you, I never went to that church again. And this wasn't the pastor. This wasn't the service. This wasn't the meat of it. It was just some stray attender trying to be helpful, telling me, you don't belong here. I remember also when I was younger. You know, it's it's never fun to have a missionary speaker come in says the guy coming as a missionary speaker. It's never fun, because you never know if they're going to be worth listening to or not, right? Some guy who's serving in the Philippines, he's an airplane mechanic, which missions needs that, comes in and the pastor's like, you're going to preach for us. He has no clue how to preach. Give him a wrench, right? Tell him to change some oil. That's what he'll be good at. Instead, he's told to come up and preach. This guy is terrified, nervous as all get out. He gets up here to preach, and it's just as bad as you'd think it could be. And then the people are in the back ignoring him. Nobody cares that he's doing, because he's not funny or entertaining. They're just like, I don't want to listen to this. And even though we're not saying it, what are we saying? You don't belong here. I'm not going to give you my attention. You don't belong It is so easy for us to push other people away, even though we might never say, you don't belong here. Today, I'm bringing before you a group of people that you've never seen and never met. And if I were to put Pastor Flory in front of you, who is a brilliant man and a godly man who's doing phenomenal work in missions and in Africa, you got no idea who he is. Why should you care about him? Why should you care about this Africa thing that we're talking about today? Because we're one body. Because they belong here. So my cousin, Joanna, just gave birth. Beautiful baby girl. Josephine Rose. Right? Love it. And she gave birth on Monday. And so what do I do? I come here, I drive the hour and a half each way trip to, and when you... When you visit a new mom, don't stay more than a half an hour. I feel like I have to say that to people, right? They're tired. She had a C-section, so she's sore and recovering from surgery. So I drove three hours to make a half-hour visit, and I got to hold little baby Josephine. She was so cute. Cuter than my kids, even. And so as I'm holding her, I loved this girl from the moment I saw her face on Facebook. I'd never met her. I'd never seen her before. 
but it's my family and it's a baby and I loved her. And I think most people here know what that's like. If you have children, grandchildren, you love them before you've ever met them. We should love the African church before we ever meet them. Why? Because they're our body. They're our family. Just like a newborn baby. Point number four, their outcome needs to matter to us. If you love them but don't care what happens to them, we need to care of what happens to them. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I heard a joke about a Botox patient who was severely overcharged. Boy, did she look, boy, I said, but she never looked surprised, so it was okay. I told that joke wrong, I'm sorry. I just, I love Botox jokes because they never seem to get old. Get that one? Did you, did you get that one? Yeah, Okay. Botox is an interesting procedure because it actually attacks the, the nerves in our face. There is a psychological event called mirroring. What it means is you will look at somebody's face and you will mimic whatever facial expression they have. And through that, we're able to empathize with one another and kind of bond with them. But when you get Botox, they have found statistically that people with Botox have a harder time empathizing because they can't physically duplicate the micro expression on other people's faces. Interesting, right? I think that we as the American church sometimes act like we have Botox. We have a really, really hard time empathizing with people from around the world. And yet we're told that if one member suffers, all suffer together, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Do you know that Americans spend more money every year on their pets' costumes than they do on reaching the unreached people in the world? So what can we do about it? Right? Number one, support missions. Okay, that's a stupid thing to say. It's obviously, but that doesn't mean anything to us, does it? Yeah, go missions. Let's try something more practical. Get out on a mission field somewhere. Take a short-term trip somewhere around the world where they don't speak English. Why? There is nothing that will bond you to the body of Christ than singing praises with God with people in another language. I was sitting at home with my dad playing the one-up game of how, you know, how many different languages have you sung praises with Jesus in, which is a weird thing to have a contest over, right? I think he won. But when you're singing praises with the Russians, in Portuguese, in Kirundi, in all these other languages, and you realize the body of Christ is not just this building, you bond instantly with them. A few other things you can do. Adopt a missionary. Take one specifically and love on them. Send them messages, send them care packages, pray for them regularly. Volunteer stateside with things that are needed. Well, how can I help the agency while I'm still here at home? Sign up for a newsletter for whichever missions organization or people you want to pr uh, support. Pray for them on a regular basis. Now, let's just grab any random mission agency just out of the air, okay? Let's just say maybe becoming mature. Well, just, just for an example, right? We will take you to Africa with us. There is so much work that needs to be done there. In fact, I am eagerly looking for somebody that can minister to children. They have so many children over there, and they're just quickly pushed aside and pushed out of the way so the adults can do things. Some people that can come and run a VBS. And you don't need crafts. You don't need supplies. You play games. You sing in English. They will love you instantly. Maybe you can adopt a missionary, right? We would love to send reports to you about what is happening in Africa so you can rejoice with us. We definitely need help here stateside because we don't have full-time workers. We have people that all volunteer for this. So I need connections, people who know people who know people. I just found a connection that's helping me get Bibles for about $5 a piece, which is phenomenal, that are in Swahili that we can take down with us. Sign up for newsletters. Our latest newsletter is back on that back table. It'll give you uh, directions on what's happening, what's going on, and how you could support us. And then lastly, please commit to praying for us regularly. We need the Lord behind everything we do. Otherwise, we are completely and utterly helpless if we can't have that. So in conclusion, there is one body. You belong to that body. They belong to that body. And what happens to them matters. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Let me ask you this. Have you ever stepped on a Lego? Now, I can see the older generation out here going, that is nothing. You should see Jax. 
little tiny spike balls. You step on one of those and it makes your scalp tingle, okay? When the African church is under persecution, it needs to make your scalp tingle because they're one body. We should rejoice with them and we should suffer with them because this is our family. If one member suffers, all suffer together, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, we praise you for the work that you have given us. We praise you for the report that I can bring about the blessings and the wondrous things that you are doing in Africa. Lord, I pray that you would give us a burden for missions, for the work that you're doing. Help us to love the field and love the lost just like you do, that we would reach them with everything that we have. Be with us. Give us your eyes, your ears, and your heart. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Lead me to Calvary. say our benediction and then we will dismiss with take the name of Jesus with you if you would repeat with me now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. He will be at the back. Go ahead and make your way back there quickly. And with the brochures, if you'd like to say something to him or ask him about Africa, he will be there. God bless. Amen.